Welcome everyone and good evening. Welcome to the National Pancreas Foundation's 2021 Virtual Education Series. I'm Trisha O'Neill, the National Chapter Director of Development for NPF. The National Pancreas Foundation provides hope for those suffering from pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through funding cutting edge research, advocating for new and better therapies, and providing support and education for patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Some of our featured programs include the Animated Pancreas Patient, state chapters that support education, fundraising, and patient support, and our physician programs that include research grants, medical education, and our annual fellows and symposium. Our success depends on the support of many individuals and organizations. You can make a difference by joining NPF as a volunteer, making a donation, or sharing your own personal story. Tonight, in conjunction with the University of Minnesota's Masonic Children's Hospital, we will kick off our pediatric TPIAT education series, empowering families and young patients with pancreatitis. Tonight's session will cover TPIAT for children with pancreatitis. What do you need to know as a parent of a child with pancreatitis? Please use the Q&A portal of this webinar to ask your questions and Dr. Bellin will field those questions at the end of tonight's presentation. We will also have a series of session two, which will be held Tuesday, October 5th at 7 p.m. And it will address nutrition, exocrine insufficiency, and diabetes after pediatric TPIAT. Session three will be held on Tuesday, October 19th at 7 p.m. covering what to know about life after TPIAT for the teenager, patient perspectives on school, social life, and other topics. We are fortunate to have Dr. Melina Bellin as our moderator this evening. Dr. Melina Bellin is a physician scientist, tenured associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Endocrinology, and the Department of Surgery at the University of Minnesota. She's a longtime friend of NPF, and we appreciate her and all of her colleagues for their support tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, and thank you to the National Pancreas Foundation for partnering with our team at the University of Minnesota for this series of seminars. As Trish mentioned, this is the first of three uh, seminar series, and I'm pleased to be here to present uh, my colleagues who are speaking tonight. This particular session is going to address the, the, the TPIAT surgery and consult process and the pain management piece. And we will uh, be uh, speaking in a couple weeks, uh, more specifically on nutritional and exocrine insufficiency and diabetes management after surgery. Our first speaker this evening is our nurse practitioner and uh, amazing coordinator for our team, Marie Cook, uh, who's been working with this population for probably at least 15 years now. And she knows the ins and outs of, of what uh, the process is when patients come through for a consult for TPIAT. And she is going to begin this evening uh, speaking on that. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Dr. Bellin. Uh, just give me one minute to get my slides going here. And um, let's see. Perfect. Thank you. There we are. So um, I'm going to speak tonight about what you can expect. And this talk is intended to give you information about the TPIT consult. So what is a TPIT? What do the letters stand for? When you think of transplant, you might think that the cells come from someone else, but they are your cells that are moved from your pancreas to your liver. The pancreatectomy is the removal of the pancreas. The I stands for the islet cells, or those clusters of cells in the pancreas that secrete hormones, insulin, and glucagon to help control your blood sugar. Auto means these, trans these cells come from you, they're your cells. And transplant means that they are moved or transferred from your pancreas to your liver. The slide on the left shows the picture of the islet cells, which you can see are red. TPIT is a surgical option for patients with pancreatitis where islets are isolated from the pancreas infused or transplanted into the liver where they release insulin to control blood sugars or blood glucose. Those are used interchangeably, sugar and glucose. 
The history of the TPIT began at the University of Minnesota in 1977. Dr. David Sutherland did the first TPIT at that time. In 1989, we did the first patient under age 18, and to date we've done 156 pediatric cases and a total of 811 adult and pediatric cases to this date. What does the pancreas do? The pancreas has two main functions. One is it has exocrine function. It secretes enzymes, amylase, and lipase to help digest the food you eat. And endocrine function is the second thing that your pancreas does. It secretes insulin and glucagon from the beta cells or islet cells to maintain glucose levels in the body. Why might someone be a candidate for TPIT? Patients who are candidates for TPIT would have either recurrent acute or chronic pancreatitis. Recurrent acute pancreatitis is episodes of pain alternating with periods of recovery where you feel pretty good in between. Chronic pancreatitis is almost constant pain. Recurrent acute pancreatitis may develop into chronic pancreatitis. Both are associated with severe pain and damage to the pancreas. How do patients get referred for a TPIT? A lot of parents find us by searching the internet. There are online support groups by parents on Facebook. There's a website called childhoodpancreatitis.org. They might find out about it through NPF. Or your local gastroenterologist may refer your child for a TPIT. What is the process to get evaluated for TPIT? First, we obtain your child's medical records and all the x-rays and images that they've had done. We'll talk to your doctors and talk to the parents about your child's history of pancreatitis. By starting the referral process, we need to gather some demographic information, where you live, your child's current care team, your insurance information, and we have to obtain insurance approval before we can schedule the evaluation. Pre-visit planning for the evaluation includes reviewing all of these records and your child's unique history of pancreatitis, how old they are when they were diagnosed, how many attacks they've had, how many hospitalizations, how it's impacting their life, what has already been done to treat the pancreatitis. We also review immunizations that your child has had and maybe the dates of last MRCP that they've had done, if they've had that done. We also try to manage expectations during this time. You'll have a lot of questions. Will my child be a candidate? How long will we be there? Where will we stay? How will we pay for this? The appointments are scheduled over three days. Your child will see doctors and have lab tests and a boost test and an MRCP, which is an imaging study. Your child will be seen by a multidisciplinary team, and I'm gonna review what the responsibilities are for each member of the team. As you can see, our team has many members. First, I'll talk about me. I'm a transplant coordinator and a nurse practitioner. I'll explain the TPIT and what your child will need to do before and afterwards, and I'll help guide you through the process. I can be a resource for you and help you connect to your child's providers I can also connect you to other families who've had TPIT. It's always good to talk, talk with another family who's been through this when your child is going through this. I will review your child's immunizations and make recommendations for more immunizations, and I will communicate with your local doctors. You'll also see a surgeon who will discuss the risks and the benefits and the possible complications of the surgery and talk if laparoscopic procedure is possible and whether a TPIT is the right option for your child or if any other surgery might be a better alternative. Your child will see a gastroenterologist or a pancreas doctor and your child will have a physical exam. They will review the medical history and test to make sure TPIT is right for your child They'll review medications like pancreatic enzymes and vitamins that your child might need, and they'll optimize your child's bowel care plan. Many children with pancreatitis have constipation, 
and they may need Miralax or Senna to help with that problem. Or some children with pancreatitis have very greasy, oily stools, and pancreatic enzymes can help in that situation. Your child will see an endocrinologist or a diabetes doctor to review the tests of your child's endocrine function and to see how well the islet cells make insulin and discuss their risk for diabetes. They'll help care for your child after surgery and discuss insulin pumps and sensors and help manage blood glucose with insulin. Your child will see a pain management doctor who is an expert in managing pain and will meet with you and your child and help optimize your child's overall well-being. And we talk about the four S's and Dr. Armfield will go into that more this evening, but how they're sleeping, how is their school attendance? Are they able to go? Are they able to participate in sports or other activities, physical activities? How is their social interaction? Are they able to do the things that they want to do? Or is pancreatitis getting in the way of that? They will help develop a plan for managing your child's pain before, during, and after the hospitalization. A social worker will help to determine how well you and your family can cope with surgery and follow a treatment plan. They'll help you learn about available resources for your child, financial resources, support group, the child would be eligible for the Make-A-Wish program. There's another organization called CODA or Children's Transplant, Assor uh, Organ Transplant Association, which can help you um, maybe do some fundraising activities to raise money for lodging or transportation. And they'll also talk to you about our Ronald McDonald House, which is a place where a lot of our families stay when they come here for surgery. The child will see a registered dietitian. Nutrition is a very important before and after TPIT. A dietitian will help make sure that your child gets good nutrition before by maybe um, putting uh, into place a weight management program or sometimes making sure that your child is getting adequate calories to make sure that they are in the best health possible for the surgery. During the hospitalization, they help the physicians manage the tube feedings that your child will need. And after the surgery, they will help wean off the tube feeds and transition to a regular diet. A genetic counselor will see your child and provide information and advice to the healthcare team. A high number of patients that undergo TPIOT have some form of hereditary pancreatitis. Oftentimes, more than one person in the family has pancreatitis. They will explain the different types of hereditary pancreatitis and their risks. I've only put four up, but these would be the four most common hereditary types of pancreatitis. Child will see a psychologist. Children with chronic pancreatitis have often had many years of illness and or pain before TPID. The effects of this trauma may last beyond the surgical period. A pediatric psychologist will meet with you and your child to help understand how you and your child can cope with the stress and of chronic illness. A psychologist will be available when your child is in the hospital to help care for your child's psychological needs. We have a team of integrative specialists. Integrative health brings conventional and complementary approaches together in a coordinated way. They'll help discuss the different interventions that can be provided for symptoms associated with TPIT such as nausea, constipation, poor sleep, and pain. Interventions can include energy work, massage therapy, aromatherapy, music therapy, clinical self-hypnosis, and biofeedback. A physical therapist are, is a movement specialist who helps to improve the quality of life through prescribed exercises and hands-on care in patient education. A physical therapist will examine your child and help develop a treatment plan to improve their ability to move, reduce or manage pain, restore function, and prevent disability. We have a child family life specialist, and they are a very important member of our team. They're someone who has a background in child development, who works with patients, siblings, and family members to facilitate a positive hospital experience. They can provide a tour of the hospital and clinic to allow you to explore and become familiar with the hospital environment. 
if your child returns for surgery or other procedures. And they can provide, provide support and distraction for needed tests or procedures or lab draws. They can teach and educate about TPIT surgery, the recovery process, and staying healthy at home. They offer support and age-appropriate education for siblings and to encourage family-centered care. They, have, they help with occupational and physical therapy and setting goals for your child. And they help to process the medical experiences by teaching how to role play and coping and relaxation techniques. A very important member of our team is the CMA or Certified Medical Assistant or Scheduler. And they help to pick a date for the evaluation and send you information about our program. They'll schedule all the needed appointments and send you the evaluation schedule and help you navigate your time at the university and in Minneapolis. A typical schedule is a three-day schedule and it looks something like this. And I'll go over uh, the tests that will happen, ha uh, happen. I already went over the specialists that your child would see. But it's a pretty intensive three-day period of time where you're meeting all the people on the team and having testing for your child. The first test is called, we call it a boost test. It requires your child to drink boost or a protein shake, and it will require IV line placement. And then we are drawing bloods every 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. And there are several other labs that we look at too including looking at blood glucose and C-peptides, which measure insulin production. We look at vitamin levels and do genetic testing if that hasn't already been done. Imaging studies are done to evaluate the pancreas size and stones and ductal abnormalities. These are just some of the imaging studies your child might have. The MRCP is always done. And it's important that we transplant the islet cells into a healthy liver. And in a small child, we wanna look at what we call the volume or the size of the liver, because the liver needs to be big enough to accept these cells. They may have an abdominal ultrasound, an EUS, an ERCP, and a CT scan. I'll explain all of these tests. An MRCP is a magnetic resonance cholangeal pancreatography. Pictures are made with large magnet and radio waves, and images of the uh, gallbladder and pancreas and bile ducts are shown. And it also is very important for evaluating the blood vessels that go to the pancreas. And we do sedate smaller children for this procedure because it requires lying very still for the procedure. An abdominal ultrasound uses sound waves that bounce off the pancreas and gallbladder and liver and other organs and it evaluates the gallbladder for stones, it creates an imaging called a sonogram on a video monitor. An EUS isn't very commonly done in children, but you might hear about it. It's an endoscopic retrograde cholangeal pancreatography. It involves inserting a thin tube into the mouth and down the stomach and the first part of the small intestine. And at the tip of that tube, there's a small ultrasound probe that emit sound waves, and those are converted into black and white images, which allow the physician to get very detailed images of the pancreas and detect abnormalities, and it can detect small tones, stones in the gallbladder and bile ducts. An ERCP is an endoscopic retrograde cholangeal pancreatography scan, and it, this is also a scope inserted down the throat after it's numbed with medication, Young children are sedated, and the doctor can then view the abdominal organs and perform procedures if needed through the scope. Sometimes stents are placed into the pancreatic ducts for dilation and fixing of strictures in that um, duct and on the multiple ducts. It's a very important test that many patients have done to rule out if something can be done before a TPIT. A CT scan of the abdomen or pancreas might be done. It's a non-invasive x-ray that produces 3D images. And this is very important if your child is having acute pancreatitis. It looks for inflammation or infection in the pancreas. 
And it's very important not to do TPIT surgery if there's inflammation at the time or you don't collect as many islet cells at the time of the surgery. Genetic testing is a blood test that identifies types of inherited gene mutations. Many patients have had this done prior to coming um, to our center, but if it hasn't been done, we would do that. Also, a fecal elastase stool study is done. This test is um, of the pancreas makes sure that you have sufficient enzymes to digest your food. And if you aren't digesting your food properly and you have severe pancreatic um, insufficiency, then you will have greasy, oily stools. And it lets us know if, we need, if your child needs to take pancreatic enzymes before surgery. So once the patient and family have been seen by all members of the team and informed of the risks and benefits of the procedure and education has been provided to help you make an informed decision and your questions have been answered and you know how to reach us if you have more questions, you need to understand the next steps of the plan. And that is that your child will be presented to the chronic pancreatitis committee on Wednesday evenings between 5 and 6 p.m. Everyone on the committee, uh, on, your, on the multidisciplinary team, will be on this committee meeting. We will review all the blood tests and imaging. And then you will be contacted with recommendations that this, the committee might have. And if they recommend surgery, we'll talk about dates and times. Or there may be some non-surgical options that we want to talk about. Other things to do with the, before the surgery may be that your child needs a little more help with psychology in order to be better prepared for a big surgery like this. They may need to lose weight or may, they may, may need to have improved nutrition before surgery. And we always do some special immunizations um, to prepare the child for surgery. So at the time of the TPIT, you would arrive one week before time Surgical preps are going to include more labs and seeing all the members of the team again. Your child would have a bowel clean out because we want to make sure that their bowel is empty before going to the operating room. The length of the surgery is about 12 hours. The surgery might be done laparoscopic if your child is big enough or it would be an open incision if it's a very small child. The pancreas was removed the gallbladder and the spleen, and there is reconstruction of the GI tract. The pancreas is then sent to the lab for processing. Your child would stay in the ICU for one to two weeks afterwards and transferred to the floor for another one to two weeks. The hospital stay is approximately three weeks plus or minus. Discharge from the hospital, then your child would stay locally with the family, probably at a place like Ronald McDonald House for a total of about four weeks from the time of, uh, eight weeks, pardon me, from the time of arrival until the time you go back home. There are weekly clinic appointments with all the specialists. Before you go home, there'll be education to talk about the medications that your child would be on, including pain medications, vitamins, pancreatic enzymes, antacids, antibiotics, and stool softeners. There will be diabetes education to talk about monitoring blood sugars and the use of insulin pumps. When you go home, you'll see your local doctor and you'll have follow-up visits either um, at home or back here at three, six, and 12 months post-op and then annually. And the goal of this whole procedure is to decrease pain and improve quality of life. And here's a picture of our hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Our, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Srinath Chinakola. He is a professor of surgery in the Division of Transplantation. He's a pediatric transplant surgeon, and one of his areas of expertise is TPIT. I think he's done about 150 of these uh, TPIT cases now. So he is, he is gonna present on the, uh, the, the surgery itself and the process of surgery. 
good afternoon good evening everyone and i'm going to try to share my screen here can all all of you see my screen yes we can see it dr chinacola uh, oh good evening can you see it well now i, I can see it uh dr chinacola it's in the the presenter mode so we can see the current slide and the next slide but i can see it Okay, I'll do my best here. Sorry for the... All right. So I'll, my name is Srina Chinakodla, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I want to particularly thank the National Pancreas Foundation, as well as my colleagues here. Um, all of you know why pancreatitis causes pain. Now, I'll take you through a case, a typical case of what we do at the University of Minnesota. So this is a 10-year-old child from California who was diagnosed to have pancreatitis. Unfortunately, this child had 30 episodes of pancreatitis in the last three years, and they had tested positive for a genetic mutation, PRSS1. And in spite of the ERCP and stent placement, the child did not improve. They were not attending school. They were not uh, able to eat and they were on feeding tubes. And um, the gastroenterologist from UCLA referred them to our hospital. So when they initially called here, I told them, well, this is how it looks like in Minnesota, not the nice picture that Maria had shown you. And uh, they, in spite of looking at this picture, they said, well, we'll come on, we'll come on over. So after coming here, uh, they went through a multidisciplinary evaluation process, which Marie, my colleague, very nicely described to you. So we, when we evaluate patients, we make sure that surgery is the right treatment for them. And if the, we can do anything else to improve it, we try to offer those treatments as well. In this particular patient, they had failed endoscopic treatment and they were also having recurrent attacks, which was significantly affecting their quality of life. So we decided to go ahead and offer this procedure. And this discussion happens in a multidisciplinary team uh, consisting of all those individuals that Marie had nicely presented to you. And we review all the tests that were done and were, we reviewed all the tests that were done in UCLA as well as um, here. So we always do an MRI on all children. Often we repeat the MRI here at the university. The main reason to repeat the MRI is that, um, as you know, during the procedure, as I will show you, we'll have to put the islet cells into the liver. So we have to make sure that there is enough liver volume. In general, we accept uh, if a child has vol liver volumes of 400 cc's, then we can proceed with TPIT. At our program, we offer TPIT for all ages of children. I think the youngest we have done is three years, and of course, three up to 18 at the pediatric hospital. Um, so briefly, this diagram shows you the procedure that we do. We essentially take out the pancreas and the spleen. The spleen comes out because the blood supply to the spleen it goes through the pancreas. We also take a little bit of intestine, the duodenum, and after that, we do a reconstruction. Um, so that is the diagrammatic picture. Now I'll take you through this actual case. So the first thing we do is um, we identify the pancreas and then we mobilize the duodenum. It's a maneuver called a Coker's maneuver. As to give you a quick tour here, this is the liver here, that's the gallbladder, this is the duodenum, the pancreas is behind. And here we are trying to clean off the tissue and reflect the duodenum medially. The next picture is we divide the um, duodenum, like I showed you earlier in the cartoon, 
it's kind of hard to see here, but if you can see this arrow, we divide the intestine right here and right here. It's a little bit of intestine, probably approximately a couple of inches. Then the next step is to uh, mobilize the spleen and the pancreas. Um, if you can appreciate this organ here is the spleen. And as you can see here, this is the pancreas. So we essentially uh, mobilize the spleen and the pancreas and bring it medially. After that, there is a very important vein uh, that drains the blood supply of the spleen. And as you can see, that is the uh, splenic vein. And the artery, the blood supply to the pancreas is from an artery called the splenic artery. As you can see here, it's down below here, and I've put this small loop to identify it. So those two things are the next step in the procedure. Then after that, there is another blood vessel that comes from the upper border of the pancreas called the gastroduodenal artery, and we loop that artery. One of the major difference between doing a pancreatectomy for chronic pancreatitis and islet transplantation and other pancreatectomies is that we preserve the blood supply of the pancreas till the very end. We do that because the islet cells receive the blood supply and we don't want to compromise the blood supply to them. So in order to preserve the viability of those cells, this is the procedure, the method we do, keep the blood supply intact until the very end. The next step is there is a big vein called the portal vein that transmits the blood from the intestines through the pancreas into the liver. And that is uh, a pesky vein. And as you can see here, I don't know if you can appreciate it, it's right deep in there. So we try to free the pancreas from that vein. And this is actually the most challenging part of the surgery. Then after that, once we have isolated the blood supply of the pancreas, and we have mobilized the entire pancreas and spleen. Essentially, the pancreas and the spleen hang by the blood supply. So at that point, we alert our islet lab. And once the islet lab folks are ready, then we are clamped the vessel. So immediately, we cool the pancreas in ice. Now, we do this uh, cooling immediately. So that way, the islet cells are preserved. Their metabolic activities decrease and we are able to keep the viability. So this is uh, the pancreas that we have put in ice right away. And you can see that this is the body of the pancreas, the, the head of the pancreas here, the body of the pancreas, uh, the head here, body here, and then tail, and then this is the spleen. And this is the little part of the intestine that we have removed. So now immediately my lab um, personnel and colleagues will be immediately available to take this pancreas to the lab. So in the lab, what they do is that um, they inject a digestive enzyme into the pancreatic duct. So what that does is that it digests all the tissue except the islet cells. So then the islet cells are passed through this chamber and essentially uh, you can see here, this is the chamber they use, and it's called a Riccardi chamber. And after that, they spin it around. So essentially, all the non islet cells separate out, and the islet cells spin at a different uh, level, and that is how the islets are purified. So while all this is being done in the lab, what we do is that we put back the intestines together. Now, in this picture, you can see that to give you a tour, this is the liver here, this is the gallbladder, this is the stomach going all the way down, intestines, the pancreas is here, the spleen. So all the gray area is what we remove. So spleen, pancreas, intestine, gallbladder. And while my colleagues in the lab are processing the islet cells, what we do is we do reconstruction. We essentially connect the bile duct back to the intestine and we create what is called as a rule limb. This technique has been changed uh, over the years, but this seems to work best for the intestines. And then we connect the uh, duodenum to the duodenum here, 
and then we connect these two and this is what we call as a rule in and this goes down now once the islets come back what we do is that we infuse them into the liver so i'll just show that to you in a minute um how do the islet cells look i used to wonder them and i wonder as well and this is how they look i mean my lab colleagues put the islets under the microscope and as you can see this is how an islet cell looks like under the microscope this is the cell that makes the insulin now when the cells come back they come back in a bag as you can see here and what we do is we connect them directly into the portal vein like i showed you earlier and in this particular patient I had a very good yield we generally say that if you have about 5000 islet equivalents per kilogram it's a good yield but this particular patient had um, 8000 and i must say that um, this is all credit to my lab folks the lab folks we have here are probably the best in the country perhaps the best in the world like I give them any pancreas, somehow magically they give me islets back. And I really am very grateful to be able to work with them and uh, have that expertise for our patients. The islets are generally infused into the uh, lab. Now here, there's a picture I wanted to show you. This is Dr. Freeman. I want to acknowledge Dr. Freeman. Dr. Freeman is actually the backbone of our program. He is got so much enthusiasm and interest in the patients. He's such a great advocate for the patient that anytime we do a case, he's always there making sure that we don't screw up and making sure we do it right. And here's Dr. Freeman shows up in the OR making sure that I'm doing the, my job correctly. And I want to uh, thank Dr. Freeman. And Dr. Freeman is a real asset to not only our program, but to all our patients. He has a lot of experience in the field. And I think that if your child was to come to the University of Minnesota, Dr. Freeman with his expertise in pancreatitis can evaluate them and can tell you if there are other treatments other than TPIT that can be offered. So truthfully, the child gets not only our uh, experience, but the expertise of a very experienced uh, pancreatologist. Um, now, after the islets are in, then next we close up. As you can see here, uh, this is the this was done laparoscopic. This is the main hand port, and then two um, side ports. I must uh, um, tell you that most of the procedure is done laparoscopic, but the critical part, the critical part where the portal vein goes through the pancreas and goes into the liver, that part we don't do it laparoscopic because I personally feel it's safer to do it open. So we do it through this small incision. So when we call laparoscopic, it is actually laparoscopic assisted. Uh, most of it, 75 or 60 to 75% done laparoscopic, but the critical part is done open. After that, we put a feeding tube in and we put a drain in and then the patient goes to the intensive care unit. Now in the intensive care unit, I usually after this time, I go and put my feet up in the lounge and try to get something to eat and drink. And my colleagues, doc, the intensive care doctors and Dr. Bell and take over and they, and Dr. Schwarzenberg as well are pediatric gastroenterologists and they have a wonderful uh, orchestra that manages the patient afterwards patient is on feeds, insulin, et cetera, et cetera. And in this particular patient, and we also do an ultrasound to make sure that the uh, blood supply, the portal vein, et cetera, is good. And as you can see here, in this particular patient, the portal vein was good. And this patient did very well and got discharged on the postoperative day 13. Um, during the process of giving the islets, uh, anytime you put a foreign a tissue into the liver, there is a risk of clotting. So to prevent that, we have developed our own protocol here. We use dextran, which is very unique to our program. And dextran actually has helped implantation of the islets and preventing complications. We also do heparin. And this cartoon tells you why we do what we do. And um, I think this is also extremely unique to our program. And following this protocol has enabled us to 
have better insulin graft survival long-term, short-term and long-term as well. So fast forward, this patient um, 30 days later came to the clinic. As you can see, the scar is really nicely healed. You really can't uh, uh, even see it that well. And it's a small scar for a big operation. So that's the advantage of our laparoscopic assisted procedure. Um, this patient did very well. They were pain-free and completely came off pain medications. Thanks to Dr. Armfield, whom you're gonna hear from. And then I saw them in the clinic a year later and they were completely pain-free, off insulin and back to school. So this is a typical case of a pediatric um, pancreatectomy at the University of Minnesota. We have already done, as you know, many studies and we have essentially shown that if you do a, a good job and get good eyelids and they're insulin independent, the quality of life seems to be better. So with that, I'm going to stop. And um, there is a nice video on the childhood pancreatitis um, website and you, please feel free to um, watch the video. With that, um, I'm going to stop and thank you very much for your attention. I went a little bit fast because you know you don't need a surgeon that talks too much. You just need a surgeon that can do a good operation. Thank you all. Yeah. Th thank you, Dr. Chinakola. Uh, our final speaker tonight is Dr. Matt Armfield. Dr. Armfield is an assistant professor of pediatrics and his area of expertise is, is pain management. And I think a lot of people hear pain doctor and they think of uh, medications, pain medications. I think as Dr. Armfield will tell you, pain management is, is so much more broad than that. Uh, Dr. Chinakola, I think you need to end your screen share most likely so Dr. Armfield can put his up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bowen. Uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Matthew Armfield. Uh, I, am, I am a pediatric pain doctor. Uh, I also like the pancreas. I wear fun t-shirts and I love dad jokes. Uh, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, obviously pain from uh, uh, pancreatitis and what we can do before the TP8 surgery and afterwards. But before I do, I do have something really important to tell you. Sorry, I can't get rid of your pain. But you, you can cure your pain. Uh, really, the point of our pain management program is to, uh, yes, provide medications for the acute post-op period uh, to making sure that you're, um, you or your child is comfortable, but also really to give them the skills to make sure that the, um, their pain doesn't uh, come back and what to do if they have uh, worsening pain afterwards and before. So you can absolutely cure your own pain, but you do have to be willing to do whatever it takes to get rid of that pain. And even if it means hard work. And it does take a lot of hard work uh, in order to uh, get to the point where we think it, you are ready to undergo the surgery. And then also it takes hard work to remain pain-free after the surgery. Uh, but I have yet to see a patient that has not been willing and has not been able to do the hard work. So if you're ready, uh, let's get on board. And, and before, um, we'll start the journey today. Before um, I talk about the details uh, about uh, the TPA surgery, what you do before and afterwards, I do need to talk about pain in general. So you probably know pain is common. So common that most everyone on this planet has experienced pain one time or another in life. But because it's so common, it must serve some purpose. It must be important to your body somehow. And it is, pain is a warning sign. It tells you when you're doing something stupid that you need to stop, or it tells you that there might be something wrong that's going on inside your body that you need to get checked out. For example, if you put your hand in a hot stove, pain will take you, tell you to take your hand off. 
If you don't, you'll cause more harm, you burn your hand, which could lead to even more disastrous outcome. Uh, you could lose your hand, you can get septic, have an infection, and you can actually possibly die, which is usually bad. And your body, your brain, and pain all work together like a smoke detector in your home. When the smoke detector detects smoke, it sounds an alarm, which serves as a warning sign to you that there might be a fire nearby because fires cause smoke and you, uh, you need to do something to protect you from that harm. Your brain works in the same way. When your brain gets a signal from certain nerves in your body, it causes pain, which serves as the warning sign to you that some part of your body could be damaged. So you need to stop doing what you're doing and you need to get it checked out. But notice that both the smoke detector or your brain can't detect the actual problem directly. The smoke detector doesn't detect a fire, it detects the smoke, which assumes it's from a fire. But what if that smoke wasn't from a fire that could endanger your life? What if it was just from a cooking malfunction, which produces the same smoke, but no life-threatening fire? The smoke detector can't distinguish between the two. It just sounds the same alarm regardless of where the smoke is coming from. So if there was a fire, the alarm was a helpful warning sign. If it was just smoke coming from your kitchen, it was annoying false alarm that does you no good. And this is similar to, we're gonna talk about acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is that warning sign that's very, very helpful. And chronic pain is that annoying false alarm that unfortunately does, it certainly does not do you any good, but it can cause much damage as well. So we're going to talk about this uh, idea of non-helpful alarms versus helpful alarms um, and relate that to individuals with pancreatitis, like this guy here. So since he has hereditary pancreatitis, several times a year, his pancreas becomes inflamed. And this causes his pancreas pain nerve to send signals to his brain saying like, hey, we've got a problem down here. You need to get this fixed. He goes to the hospital, gets treated with fluids and pain medications. And four to five days later, his pancreas calms down and his pain goes away. And he can go about his life as usual. And this is the type of pain that most people are familiar with. We call it tissue damage pain or inflammatory pain. Uh, doctors call it nociceptive pain, but they all mean the kind of same thing, pain coming from damaged tissue. And that's exactly what acute pancreatitis is, pain from tissue damage or inflammation. Um, it causes inflammatory pain, and that type of pain can be treated quite well with medications such as Tylenol, ibuprofen, and if needed, opioids. However, over time, and after repeated episodes of pancreatitis, something different can actually occur. So as before, inflammation of his pancreas causes the nerve to send warning signals to his brain, forming him to go to the hospital, get treated with fluids and uh, pain medications until his pancreas calms down. But afterwards, his pain never really goes away. His nerves have been active for so long with the repeated attacks of uh, pancreatitis that even when the cause of the pain is treated, there's no more fire there, these nerves remain active for much, much longer. Left untreated, these nerves will never calm down and he will consistently experience pain. You think about back to the house example, the, the uh, house fire example, after a devastating house fire, all of this fire has been extinguished. So there's no more real danger, but there's still a lot of smoke. And so that smoke detector, if it wasn't probably melted in the fire, would still be going off regardless of that there's no fire there. The signal persists after the fire is gone. So this type of pain is very different because there's no active tissue damage that's happening. Ted's pancreas in this case is healed but his nerves are still sending pain signals to his brain. Therefore, the pancreas is not the problem. His brain is not the problem, but it's his overactive nerves that are the problem. And nerves, just like any other organ and tissue in your body, can certainly become damaged as well. And they can uh, do things that they're not supposed to do, like send pain signals when there's no reason to. 
And so this is injured nerve pain, we call it neuropathic pain, or pain that coming from your nerves themselves. And if they never turn off and are just always active, two problems can develop. Peripheral sensitization, which just kind of means in the body, and central, meaning in the brain or spinal cord sensitization. Basically, you can just think about this as his nervous system is so sensitive that he feels more pain than would be expected because the nerves in that part of his body are extremely sensitive. So more signals get sent to his brain than normal. And his brain also treats all these signals as important and doesn't stop them from entering his brain. Your brain can actually do a really good job of sorting out all this information it gets from your body into what's important and what's not important. When you've had pain for so long, that mechanism, that system of figuring out what's important or not important, is not working right. It just thinks everything is important because it doesn't know what's a warning signal and what is just a false alarm. And so, unlike just smoke coming from your kitchen and your fire alarm being just really annoying, patients with chronic pain it can really affect their life. And you can just talk to anyone with chronic pain and they'll tell you really a lot of the same story. But patients with chronic pain, I mean, life just doesn't stop for them. They still have to keep functioning. They have to go to school. In order to go to school, you have to be active. You have to walk from class to class. You have to be social and you need to get a good night's sleep. So even though they're not functioning at the best, they are just functioning to get along. And so they must adapt and figure out a way to do normal things besides stealing constant daily pain. And so this creates a big problem for any chronic pain patient, including patients with chronic pancreatitis and pain on a daily basis. Because he or she learned how to adapt in order to function, he or she does not act the way most people would expect someone in constant pain to act. So, this leads to kind of dismissal of their pain from friends, families, and even some doctors. They say like, oh, you don't look like you're in pain. You're faking it. If you're in so much pain, how can you play video games? But even if one behaves the way others would expect you to, since there's really nothing wrong with his or her body, because there's no inflammation in the pancreas if you're to look at it, especially when you go into the emergency room and they can't find anything wrong, then he or she is told, are you really in that much pain? Oh, the pain's all in your head. Nothing's wrong with you. You just want attention. And really, whenever they hear uh, statements like that, they're just being reminded that everyone thinks their pain is not real, that they're faking it. And hearing this over and over and over again, that sometimes these patients can actually start believing that. So I went to say something very clearly and very important that if you remember one thing from my talk, it's this, your pain is real. You have to believe that because you're not going to be able to fix your pain if you don't think that it really exists. So your pain is absolutely real. So back to our example. He has inflammatory pain, which led to nerve pain, which led to chronic pain. And when his, when his inflammatory pain disappeared, and so it would make sense now that if you removed what caused the pain in the first place, so we're going to re remove the pancreas, all of his pain would go away. Nope. Here's the big problem. If your pancreas were removed while your nervous system is still overly sensitive, you will still most likely have the pain even without your pancreas there. Right here, we call this quote unquote phantom pancreas pain, like phantom lymph pain. And we've definitely seen this happen in some patients where they feel the exact pain that they had before when they had a pancreas, but they still feel it even when their pancreas is gone. Very, very frustrating. But there is a solution to this problem. And so, even before we even think about taking your pancreas out, you have to treat the sensitization. You have to treat your sensitive and messed up nervous system first, and then remove the pancreas to become and stay pain-free after your TPIAT. So this work in calming your nervous system down, getting it less sensitive, this is the hard work that 
we're talking about. And so it's hard, it needs to happen because we certainly do not want you to be in more pain or have your pain come back after the surgery. So there are four to five things that you we um, recommend uh, our, our patients who generally re recommend these uh, four things with um, tailored to each patient at the initial evaluation. And so we can get started on retraining and calming their nervous system down right away. And so you're not any, wait, any wasting any time uh, when we think they might be ready for the surgery. So the first recommendation is physical therapy. Why is it important before surgery? When chronic pain is impacting your daily life, you probably aren't as active. When you're not as active and not participating in your normal activities, you become deconditioned. The less strength, flexibility, stamina, and more pain you have prior to the surgery, the harder you'll need to work to, after the surgery to recover. If our patients are really deconditioned, then a referral to a physical therapist who is familiar with treating chronic pain can be very beneficial. We have two physical therapists at our hospital uh, who have specific training in treating pediatric pain. There are very few and far between in the country, and we have two of them here. And so we all are, need to remember that movement is medicine. So that's why physical therapy is, and is physical therapy is always done uh, starting the first day after the surgery and continues until you leave Minnesota to go back home. We want a physical therapist to be involved because if you do way too much right after the surgery, you, get, you can injure yourself. But if you don't do enough, you're not getting any benefit of it. So the therapist can help you find the right dose of movement. The second thing that we require from all of our patients is to go through a mental health evaluation and also speak with our psychologist. And hopefully create a relationship with our psychologists here or establish one back home, preferably both. Because anyone with chronic pain will have more stress, more depression, and more anxiety than someone without these conditions. This increased stress increases your pain, which increases your stress, which increases your pain, which increases your stress, worsens your mood, and causes more depression. So working with one of our mental health professionals or one of your own to address issues of relaxation, behavioral change, stress, coping mechanisms, sleep habits, those are all very essential for long-term success. And so since your brain has lost the ability to distinguish what information is important, what information is not important, you need to practice integrative medicine or mindfulness to retrain your brain to figure out what's important or not important. And so what is it? Well, these are all of the active non-medicine things that you can learn to reduce the sensation of pain. These are things like deep breathing, meditation, mindfulness, self-hypnosis, my favorite, guided imagery, biofeedback, progressive muscle relaxation, and there are many others. We have uh, two integrative medicine specialists at our hospital that can help teach you all of this and do many more things also. These actually help, again, retrain your brain to figure out what's important and what's not important so it filters out the right information and so you don't have too much pain signals reaching your brain so your pain can get better. And lastly, you need to live your life as if you weren't in any pain. And this can be either, either very easy for some or the most difficult recommendation of the four for others. It depends on how much pain has interfered and affected your life. So we want you to work on the four S's starting on af right after the evaluation. That's school, sports, sleep, and social. So practice good sleep hygiene. Go to bed at the, free, uh, the same time every night. Get up at uh, the same time every day. Have a bedtime routine. No bright screens within 30 minutes of going to bed. Using your bed as a sleep only zone. Uh, don't do anything else in your bed, like reading, texting, watching movies. And finally, no naps during the day. Those are things all very important to uh, try to get good sleep and develop good sleep patterns. Next, we want you to participate in sports or be in as active as possible. Uh, working with our physical therapist or working with one back home will generally cover that. You need to leave a normal social life. I do not, do not let 
pain to get in the way of doing things that you enjoy with your friends or family. I usually tell my patients that I prescribe them fun. They have to do something fun every day. And lastly, they need to go to school. This can be the most difficult of all the recommendations as proper functioning in school re requires good sleep the night before, activity going to and from class, and being social with your peers. Basically, all of the above parts of leading a normal life. You'll be going to school for the entire day, five days a week eventually, if you're not. But just like physical therapy, getting to this point might require a slow return to full-time school. And so really, we I look at uh, three things uh, in determining if you might be a good candidate from a pain perspective for our surgery. And that is attendance in school, because again, it's a kind of a proxy of everything of what a quote unquote normal life would be for uh, a child or adolescent. Uh, I look at the ability to move around and be active because on day one after the surgery, we're going to get you up and maybe not out of bed in the morning, but by that afternoon, usually most of our patients can get out of bed. And finally, the amount of opioid medications they are taking, which leads into the last bit. But before I get into the last recommendation, I do want to stress that with getting your life back to normal, it's once your life gets back to normal, then your pain will get better and not the other way around. And so in order to go back to school, in order to be active, to be social, that's really, really difficult because they're gonna to have to do those things while they might be in a lot of pain. So not only do they have to do, get their life back to normal first, but initially their pain might get worse before it gets better. But again, this is all done to make the post tapate recovery so much easier. So, if pain is limiting your involvement in life right now, I would say to anyone out there, if you're not going to school or if you're not doing social things because of pain or if it's limiting anyway, the most important thing that you can do right now is to try to reverse that and work your hardest to get your life back to normal. It's going to be hard and it might cause some pain, but let me tell you, this is the most important thing uh, to and most effective thing that you can do to become pain-free. And last, and I don't really spend much time on this because that's really not the long-term solution to uh, chronic pain, but that's medications. Um, if you're getting a TP uh, surgery, you're going to be on medications, uh, if not beforehand, but definitely afterwards. And so at the uh, first evaluation, I get a medication history, and I also get a pain history, and I, I compare the two. And if I think that a daily pain medication would be helpful, I would recommend that. And so those could be things such as gabapentin, Lyrica, amitriptyline, or an antidepressant. Opioids, benzodiazepines like Valium, Xanax, uh, Ativan, and other drugs of abuse are certainly not appropriate in this case, and especially opioids between the first evaluation and our pre-op appointment a week before the surgery, we work very, very closely with you or your son or daughter to reduce the number of opioids that they're taking, if they're taking it fairly regularly, and hopefully get it to the point where they are not taking any before the surgery. Post-TPIAT is, you'll be cared for by a team of physicians, nurses, therapists, psychologists, and others who have experience working with our TPAT patients. Um, at your visit before the surgery, a post-TPAT pain regimen will be developed with you to make sure that you're comfortable with the least number of side effects after the surgery. You will get strong IV opioids such as morphine, Dilaudid, and fentanyl. We'll use nerve blocks, other IV medications, other oral medications, pain patches, creams, and gels, really anything that we can think of uh, for the post-operative post -operative period. These medications are safely and slowly reduced over the next weeks in the hospital. Uh, many of my patients have been able to get off all of their opioids before leaving the hospital, and I've had a few uh, get off of those opioids even before leaving the ICU. And 
tapering of these medications if they is it's just more difficult because they've had more pain and that happens sometimes uh we can develop a tapering plan which is either finished uh, while you're here on follow-up visits or even some certainly have than finishing those medication tapers at home. And I'm used to all of those different scenarios. Not one is necessarily better than the other. It is just what it is for our patients. And we are uh, happy to work with them, uh, however easy or however difficult it is to get uh, our patients off of strong pain medications. Um, and each of these post tapering pain plan is unique to him or her. In general, protocol, but again, taking a look at the medication history, what your son or daughter thinks works well for them, and especially to avoid the medications that they have had problems with in the past is extremely important. So with the hard work before the TP, the five parts of our prehab program, you can we can successfully get you ready for the TP, and we've really seen such amazing uh, results from our patients because they are so ready going into the surgery for what we started with at the initial evaluation. Um, and because of that, the recovery afterwards is the same thing that they did getting ready for the t -pay. And so really, the prehab part of the uh, pain control before surgery is the most difficult part. The rehab, post-operative opera rehab is everything they've done before, no real big changes. And so at that point, it's pretty easy relatively speaking. And it does involve just the same five things, physical therapy, integrative medicine, psychology, living a normal life, and medications. And you can definitely become pain-free, and we're going to be there to help you with that. Remember, so we take you, the patient, and we surround you with a team of professionals to help you on this journey. And so even through that, we have anesthesiologists, uh, psychologist, we mentioned an integrative medicine specialist, child, family, life, music therapy, social work. And we are all de dedicated to helping you be comfortable and being able to live a life without pain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Armfield. I'll have uh, Dr. Chinakotla and Marie come back on video for our panel, and we'll take a few questions here at the end. There are um, a few in the chat. The first one is for Marie, and uh, it's related to telemedicine, which we all learned so much about over the past 18 months during COVID. And the question is, is it a possible to have an initial TPIT consult as a televisit? Um, well, during COVID, we did do a few appointments via video visits, but unfortunately, there has been some licensing issues with different states. Um, so we are trying to get everybody here in person, which really is the ideal situation. Um, it's more difficult to evaluate patients on video, but we could always talk about that. Yeah, I, I would say to Marie's comments that always just reach out if you have questions and, and coordinators like Marie are more than happy to talk. Um, the, the, the surgery is so complicated and, and there's so many people um, in the consult process that it ultimately ends up being, I think, most helpful to everyone to, to eventually see people in person. Uh, Dr. Chinakotla, there's a question for you about the, the laparoscopic or laparoscopic assisted approach. How often is that used? Or maybe you can address when are cases where you might not be able to use the laparoscopic approach? Um, the first for us is safety. Uh, safety is the most important thing for us. So we can do the surgery laparoscopic assisted safely than we would do it. In general, we avoid um, the procedure if the patient, laparoscopic procedures, if the patient had any prior surgery, for example, or any vascular, some patients have portal vein sten stenosis, some portal hypertension. So in those situations, we avoid them for safety reasons. And uh, sometimes in a very small child, it's hard to have uh, instruments that small. So if your child is like three or four years old, we'll probably do it open. So those are the, uh, up th those are the guidelines that we follow. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question here uh, is how often do children continue to need insulin well after the surgery? So I think that means long-term. 
I, I guess I can uh, speak to that. That's actually going to be uh, covered in a bit more detail in the session that occurs in, in two weeks where we're talking about more long-term management with diabetes and exocrine insufficiency. Uh, it's a little bit complicated because it depends on the patient. So if you look at, at all children coming through for this surgery, um, kids are more likely than not to have to stay on insulin lifelong, at least some insulin after surgery. About two thirds of children will use some insulin after surgery lifelong, and about a third will come off completely. Um, but kids who have uh, less um, chronic fibrosis in their pancreas, kids who we see at a much younger age, um, three, four, five, six, seven years old, uh, tend to have a much higher rate of, of coming off insulin. So I think we'll we'll come back to that in more detail in a couple of weeks too. And then Matt, there's a, a, a question for you in here about um, amitriptyline and nortriptyline in particular. Do you monitor levels of amitriptyline and nortriptyline? And if so, is there a specific therapeutic level you look for? Or maybe more generally, how do you adjust these medications clinically? Uh, yeah, um, I have generally not found a specific need to uh, measure levels, serum levels of those medications, um, mainly taking a look at the general recognized dose of using those for chronic pain, and then also just taking a look at how uh, the patient responds to those medications, um, if they're working, if they tend to wane over time, and taking a look at the dose, and if we need to switch to something or just increase the dose. Um, and so it's really kind of just clinical improvement with those medications. Uh, one thing that we do have started doing too is offering uh, what we call gene site testing. And so it's a genetic test um, that we collect in clinic to just, just swab in the inside of your cheek. And it looks at uh, the different enzymes you have mainly in your liver that uh, metabolize all these medications and to determine if you have a genetic uh, mutation that would cause these medications to either work too well or to work not enough. And so uh, I use that also to, again, if I'm deciding on two different ones to use, if that would point me in the direction of one versus the other, then I'll definitely do that. Thank you. Um, it looks like probably the final question in here, and I'll, I'll give this to Marie um, because you usually manage this part. What is the typical time period between the consult to the surgery? Uh, that can really vary depending on the patient. Um, I would say typical, probably six weeks. Sometimes we have to work with insurance companies to get the procedure approved. That can stretch out the time or they may, there may be something your child needs to do first before they're actually ready to be scheduled for surgery. So um, it, it can vary a little bit. Sometimes people come in the early phases of pancreatitis for the consult and the family's really not ready to move ahead. And we wait for you to be, be ready too. Yeah, and I, I would add sometimes we have families who timing wise will come see us maybe in November or December, but prefer to wait sure. school years out. So yeah, highly variable. Uh, all right, I think that is it for questions and we're right about at the end of time here. So I, I think uh, all of the attendees who uh, took uh, this time this evening to attend this session and certainly feel free to reach out to us if there's any follow up questions. Uh, and again, we'll be back in a, a couple weeks for the next uh, section of this. And thank you to the National Pancreas Foundation for hosting us tonight. Thank you. Everyone have a good evening. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you and have a great evening.